Part 3, Burning Bright. As we read through this, we are going to switch up the style of our notes to see how well you can do it on your own, because not only is that a valuable skill to have to be able to come up with the answers on your own, it is also extremely vital. When we move on to our next books, this is a skill that you're going to want to make sure that you have is the ability to decode and write down notes and pause as you need. So as we go through, pause when you have stuff, write it down, and then at the end of it, we'll switch to the notes that I have taken, and you can compare to what you've gotten and add in anything that you might have missed. Lights flicked on and house doors opened all down the street to watch the carnival set up. Montag and Beatty stared, one with dry satisfaction, the other with disbelief at the house before them, his main ring in which torches would be juggled and fire eaten. Well, said Beatty, now you did it. Old Montag wanted to fly too near the sun, and now he's burnt his damn wings. He wonders why. Didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound around your place? Montag's face was entirely numb and featureless. He felt his head turn like a stone carving to the dark place next door, set in its bright border of flowers. Beatty snorted. Oh no, you weren't fooled by that little idiot's routine now, were you? Flowers, butterflies, leaves, sunsets, oh hell, it's all in a file. I'll be damned, I hit the bullseye. Look at that sick look on your face, a few grass blades and a quarter of the moon. What oh, trash. What good did she ever do with all that? Montag sat on the cold fender of the dragon, moving his head half an inch to the left, half an inch to the right. Left, right, left, right, left. She saw everything. She didn't do anything to anyone. She just let them alone. Alone, hell. She chewed around you, didn't she? One of those damn do-gooders with a shocked holier-than-thou silences. That one talent making others feel guilty. God damn, they rise like a midnight sun to switch you in your bed. The front door opened. Mildred came down the steps, running. One suitcase held with a dream-like clenching rigidity in her fist as the beetle taxi hissed to the curb. Mildred. She ran past with her body stiff. Her face flowered with powder, her mouth gone, without lipstick. Mildred, you didn't put in the alarm. She shoved the valise into the waiting beetle, climbed in, and sat mumbling. Poor family. Poor family. Oh, everything gone. Everything. Everything gone now. Beatty grabbed Montag's shoulder as the beetle blasted away and hit 70 miles an hour. Far down the street. Gone. There was a crash like the falling parts of a dream fashioned out of warped glass, mirrors, crystal prisms. Montag drifted about as if still another incomprehensible storm had turned him to see stonemen in black wielding axes, shattering window panes to provide cross ventilation. The brush of a death's head moth against a cold black screen. Montag, this is Faber, do you hear me? What's happening? This is happening to me, said Montag. What a dreadful surprise, said Beatty. For well, everyone nowadays knows it's absolutely certain that nothing will ever happen to me. Others die, I go on. There are no consequences and no responsibilities except that there are. Let's not talk about them, huh? By the time the consequences catch up with you, it's too late, isn't it, Montag? Montag, can you get away? Run? asked Faber. Montag walked, but did not feel his feet touch the cement and then the night grasses. Beatty flicked his igniter nearby, and the small orange flame drew his fascinated gaze. What is there about fire that's so lovely? No matter what age we are, what draws us to it? Beatty blew out the flame and lit it again. It's perpetual motion, the one thing man wanted to invent but never did. Well, almost perpetual motion. If you let it go on, it'd burn our lifetimes out. What is fire? It's a mystery. Science gives us gobbledygook about friction and molecules, but they don't know. Its real beauty is that it destroys responsibility and consequences. A problem gets too burdensome and then into the furnace with it. Now, Montag, your burden and fire will lift you off my shoulders clean, quick, sure.
Nothing to rot later. Antibiotic to aesthetic. Practical. Montauk stood looking in, now at this queer house made strange by the hour of the night, by murmuring neighbor voices, by littered glass, and there on the floor, their covers torn off and spilled out like swan feathers, the incredible books that looked so silly and really not worth bothering with. For these were nothing but black type and yellowed paper unraveled binding. Mildred, of course, she must have watched him hide the books in the garden which brought them back in. Mildred. Mildred. I want you to do this job all by your lonesome, Montag, not with kerosene and a match, but piecework with a flamethrower. Your house, your cleanup. Montag, can't you run? Get away? No, cried Montag helplessly. The hound, because of the hound. They were heard, and Beatty, thinking it was meant for him, heard, Yes, the hound's around somewhere around the neighborhood, so don't try anything. Ready? Ready. Montag snapped the safety catch on the flamethrower. Fire! A great, nuzzling gout of fire leapt out to lap at the books and knock them against the wall. He stepped into the bedroom and fired twice, and the twin beds went up in a great, simmering whisper, with more heat and passion and light than he would have supposed them to contain. He burnt the bedroom walls and the cosmetics chest because he wanted to change everything. The chairs, the tables, and in the dining room, the silverware and plastic dishes, everything that showed that he had lived here in this empty house with a strange woman who would forget him tomorrow, who had gone and quite forgotten him already, listening to her seashell radio pour in on her, and in on her as she rode across town alone. And as before, it was good to burn. He felt himself gush out in the fire, snatch, rend, rip in half with flame, and put away the senseless problem. If there was no solution, well, then now there was no problem either. Fire was best for everything. The books, Montag! The books leapt and danced like roasted birds, their wings ablaze with a red and yellow feathers. Then he came to the parlor where the great idiot monsters lay asleep with their white thoughts and their snowy dreams, and he shot a bolt at each of the three blank walls, and the vacuum hissed out at him. The emptiness made an even emptier whistle, a senseless scream. He tried to think about the vacuum upon which the nothingness had performed, but he could not. He held his breath so the vacuum could not get into his lungs. He cut off its terrible emptiness, drew back, and gave the entire room a gift of one huge bright yellow flower of burning. The fireproof plastic sheath on everything was cut wide and the house began to shudder with flame. When you're quite finished, said Beatty behind him, you're under arrest. The house fell in red coals and black ash. It bedded itself down in the sleepy pink-gray cinders and a smoke plume blew over it, rising and waving slowly back and forth in the sky. It was 3.30 in the morning. The crowd drew back into the houses. The great tents of the circus had slumped into charcoal and rubble, and the show was well over. Montauk stood with the flamethrower in his limp hands, great islands of perspiration drenching his armpits, his face smeared with soot. The other firemen waited behind him in the darkness, their faces illuminated faintly by the smoldering foundation. Montag started to speak twice and then finally managed to put his thoughts together. Was it my wife turned in the alarm? Beatty nodded. But a friend's turned in the alarm earlier that I let ride. One way or the other, you'd have got it. It was pretty silly, quoting poetry around free and easy like that. It was the act of a silly damn snob. Give a man a few lines of verse and he thinks he's the lord of all creation. You think you can walk on water with your books? Well, the world can get by just fine without them. Look where they got you and slime up to your lip. If I stir the slime with my little finger, you'll drown. Montag could not move. A great earthquake had come with fire and leveled the house, and Mildred was under there somewhere in his entire life under there, and he could not move. The earthquake was still shaking and falling and shivering inside him. And he stood there, his knees half bent under the great load of tiredness and bewilderment and outrage, letting Beatty hit him without raising a hand. Montag. Montag, you idiot. Montag, you damn fool. Why did you really do it? 
Montag did not hear. He was far away. He was running with his mind. He was gone, leaving this dead, soot-covered body to sway in front of another raving fool. Montag, get out of there, said Faber. Montag listened. Beatty struck him a blow on the head that sent him reeling back. The green bullet in which Faber's voice whispered and cried fell to the sidewalk. Beatty snatched it up, grinning. He held it half in, half out of his ear. Montag heard the distant voice calling. Montag. You all right? Beatty switched the green bullet off and thrust it into his pocket. Well, so there's more here than I thought. I saw you tilt your head listening. First I thought you had a seashell. But when you turned clever later, I wondered. We'll trace this and drop in on your friend. No, said Montag. He twitched the safety catch on the flamethrower. Beatty glanced instantly at Montag's fingers and his eyes widened the faintest bit. Montag saw the surprise there and himself glanced to his hands to see what new thing they had done. Thinking back later, he could never decide whether the hands or Beatty's reaction to the hands gave him the final push toward murder. The last rolling thunder of the avalanche stoned down about his ears, not touching him. Beatty grinned his most charming grin. Well, that's one way to get an audience. Hold a gun on a man and force him to listen to his speech. Speech away. What'll it be this time? Why don't you belch Shakespeare at me, you fumbling snob? There is no terror, Cassius, in your threats. Why, I am armed so strong in honesty that pass by me as an idle wind, which I respect not. How's that? Go ahead now, you second-hand literature. Pull the trigger. He took one step toward Montag. Montag only said, We never burned right. Hand it over, guy, said Beatty with a fixed smile. And then he was a shrieking blaze, a jumping, sprawling, gibbering mannequin, no longer human or known, all writhing flame on the lawn as Montag shot one continuous pulse of liquid fire on him. There was a hiss like a great mouthful of spittle banging a red-hot stove, a bubbling, frothing as if salt had been poured over a monstrous black snail to cause a terrible liquefaction and boiling over of yellow foam. Montauk shut his eyes, shouted, shouted and fought to get his hands and his ears to clamp and cut away the sound. Beatty flopped over and over and over and at last twisted in on himself like a charred wax doll and lay silent. The other two firemen did not move. Montag kept his sickness down long enough to aim the flamethrower. Turn around. They turned, their faces like blanched meat. Streaming sweat, he beat their heads, knocking off their helmets and bringing them down on themselves. They fell and lay without moving. The blowing of a single autumn leaf. He turned and the mechanical hound was there. It was half across the lawn, coming from the shadows, moving with such drifting ease that it was like a single solid cloud of black-gray smoke blown at him in silence. It made a single last leap into the air, coming down at Montag from a good three feet over his head, its spider legs reaching, the procaine needle snapping out its single angry tooth. Montag caught it with a bloom of fire, a single wondrous blossom that curled in petals of yellow and blue and orange about the metal dog, clad it in a new covering as it slammed into Montag and threw him ten feet back against the bowl of a tree, taking the flame gun with him. He felt it scrabble and seize his leg and stab the needle in for a moment before the fire snapped the hound up into the air, burst its metal bones at the joints, and blew out its interior in a single flushing of red color like the skyrocket fast into the street. Montag lay watching the dead alive thing fiddle the air and die. Even now it seemed to want to get back at him and finish the injection, which was now working its way through the flesh of his leg. He felt all the mingled relief and horror of having pulled back only in time to have his knee slammed by the fender of a car hurtling by at 90 miles an hour. He was afraid to get up, afraid he might not be able to gain his feet at all with an anesthetized leg, a numbness, and a numbness hollowed into a numbness, and now street empty. The house burnt like an ancient bit of stage scenery, the other homes dark. The hound here, Beatty there, the three other firemen, another place, and the salamander. He gazed at the immense engine. 
I would have to go too. Well, he thought, let's see how badly off you are. On your feet now. Easy. Easy. There. He stood and he had only one leg. The other was like a chunk of burnt pine log. He was carrying along his penance for some obscure sin. When he put his weight on it, a shower of silver needles gushed up the length of the calf and went off in the knee. He wept. Come on. Come on, you can't stay there. A few house lights were going on again down the street. Whether from the incidents just passed or because of the abnormal silence following the fight, Montauk did not know. He hobbled along the ruins, seizing at his back leg when it lagged, talking and whimpering and shouting directions at it and cursing it and pleading with it to work for him now when it was vital. He heard a number of people crying out in the darkness and shouting. He reached the backyard and the alley. Beity, he thought, you're not a problem now. You always said, don't face a problem, burn it. Well, now I've done both. Goodbye, Captain. And he stumbled along in the alley. That is where we'll stop reading for today. Let's pull up the notes and see what we have there. So clicking on our notes, we have here uh, pages 127 to 135. That's what we read today. So in our notes, we have valise, which is a small traveling bag or suitcase. We have aesthetic, which is concerned with beauty. And there may be a couple of words there that you may have added on your own. In our notes, we have that Beatty sent the hound to Montauk's house. We finally found the answer to that question. But we have another one, which is why was Montauk so happy to burn his house? Here in our key events, the Mildred called the fire department on Montauk. Uh, Mildred then left, and Beatty makes Montauk burn his own house. Montauk burns Beatty and knocks out the other firemen. He burns the hound after it grabs his leg, and he stumbles into the darkness. So those are the notes that I have. You may have had more. You may have had fewer, but we want to make sure that we have it down everything that's vital with this. So if you miss something, uh, you can now add that on. All right. We will continue next time with pages 135 to 144.